My name is Tomas Gornick, and I'm the founder and CEO of Better. I'm also the co-chair of the OpenHR Foundation. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a concept called Data for Life. So we'll uh, do a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'll talk about the main topic, which is health and care data. Um, I'll show you a little bit about our products. Uh, we'll go through some use cases on how this approach is being used. Uh, and then I'll finish with a few slides about our company. So it's quite obvious that healthcare is changing. Uh, for one, care is shifting from hospitals to communities and even the home. Citizens are demanding access to their health data. They want to be more engaged in managing their health and fitness. And finally, COVID, obviously in the last year, has really accelerated innovation and has actually enabled new models of care. Now, on the other side, uh, users are experiencing a lot of issues with current systems. Everything from usability to uh, interoperability issues. And of course, the executives uh, are struggling with bloated TCOs of current solutions. Now, we have been trying to solve the problem of data interoperability for 25 years. Here uh, you can uh, see uh, Jordi Piera from uh, the Catalan Health Service talk about the fact that this is not working. We've been trying to do this for a very long time and to make it work, we need a fundamentally different approach. Now, it's not a coincidence that just a month ago, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care uh, in the UK, Matt Hancock, uh, talked about the fact that data today uh, is locked in proprietary systems. Now, in this case, it's not accessible uh, and it cannot provide uh, the necessary uh, underlying foundation for innovation, for research, uh, for managing patients better. Also, the way to solve this, uh, as he claims, is to separate data from applications. Now, this is something we have been saying for years, and it's good to see that the top officials, uh, government officials, are now actually also talking about this concept. And actually, this is what we will be talking about today. So the concept is called data for life. Why? Because in healthcare, we would like to keep data for the lifetime of the patient. Now, today, that's not the case. Data is tightly coupled with applications, which means that uh, we are struggling to keep this data for the lifetime of the patient as we switch applications. Now, this clearly has to change. And to do that, we need to procure systems differently, as is mentioned in this report from EY. Now, they talk about a different approach based on an open platform and a clinical data repository which is separate from applications so that all the applications connect to the same data. In terms of an architecture, they came up with uh, this uh, graphic here, which clearly explains the difference between the current approach, which is to tie data logic uh, together in an application, and the new approach, which puts data at the center of our architecture. It keeps it in a vendor neutral format and allows all the apps, applications, algorithms, devices to connect to the same data. This is uh, very much what uh, we call the vendor neutral data layer approach. And actually it's great to see that Gartner just last year also published a very similar architecture uh, than EY. So it's quite uh, safe to say that the majority of uh, the thinking of the big consultancies is now about this separation of data from applications, as you see on the Gartner slide. Now, uh, even WHO in December uh, published a, a, a research paper on the digital health platform. They called it a handbook. And it talks about the stacks the standard stacks, which can be used to facilitate this approach. Okay, now let's talk about health and care data specifically. So 
The problem that we are trying to solve uh, is presented by the fact that applications store data in proprietary formats. Here you can see three different applications dealing with medications, and each one of them uh, stores the data about uh, the medication order in a different format. Now, why does this happen? Uh, it's not really a technical issue. There's many good ways to store this data, but for business reasons, companies and vendors try to invent their own so that they can lock the customer into their application uh, environment. Now, if you think about it, we would actually like to keep this data for a very long time. That means 100 years. Now, obviously, there is no application that lasts 100 years, which means that every time we switch applications, it could be every 5, 10, 15 years, we are migrating data from one proprietary format to another. And this, of course, is very costly. Uh, a lot of times we don't do this at all and just give up and don't have historic data for this patient. So this is a huge, a huge problem uh, in healthcare and particularly because of the longevity of data. In other industries, um, 5, 10, 15-year-old data is not that important. But in healthcare, it's very important. Uh, it's even important what happened before the birth um, uh, to uh, some procedure that you might have at a later stage in your life. So obviously, this is not a new concept. Uh, in healthcare. We have been separating data from applications in imaging, for instance, for the last 30 years. Uh, even documents like PDFs are standardized to a format that any application can produce and any other application can consume. The problem is, of course, with the structured data. That's the data we depend on for analytics, for research, for AI. And unfortunately, this is still being kept in the applications that produce this data. So at OpenEHR, this is what we are trying to do. Uh, OpenEHR is a format for storing structured clinical information. And actually it's very much like the PDF or the uh, DICOM format for different types of data. So again, nothing new, but finally we're trying to release the structured data from the applications that produced it. So as I said before, OpenEHR is a format for data, but it's actually much more than that. It's a set of specifications which define platforms which can work in this way. There are several things which make OpenEHR very suitable for managing health data. The first one is that we actually use clinicians to model the data and IT experts to build software. This is a really important differentiator for OpenEHR because we firmly believe that it should be the clinicians defining the data models, and of course, IT programmers focusing on building applications, which is not always true if you think about how healthcare applications are developed today. So to give you an example, what a data model looks like, take a look at this. Um, a data model for, um, for uh, blood pressure. Um, what you notice immediately is that we are not just storing systolic diastolic. We're actually storing the context of the measurement with the measurement itself. What do I mean by that? So think about a blood pressure of 120 over 80. Uh, if you don't have the information that the patient was riding a bicycle, or was under exertion at the same time the measurement was taken, this actually means you cannot interpret the data. You don't know whether 120 over 80 is high or low. So it's key that you store the context of the data with the data itself. Next, you are trying to get as much information about how the measurement was taken. Uh, and finally, of course, you want validation of this data to happen anytime the data is being stored. So you want to say that the range of values for systolic is between zero and 300 or 400, uh, that the cuff size can be one, two, three, four, five. This is all so that you can actually have meaningful data as you pass it around, everybody can understand it the same way. 
This is all done at the model level before a single line of code is written. Now, what you realize here is that uh, this model uh, is quite rich. Uh, many times uh, you don't need as rich a model. So what we do is once we assemble these models together, to form a data model for our form, our report, our message, we actually are able to pick and choose the fields that we need for the use case. So the first model called the archetype was universal, meaning you could use it anywhere blood pressure appears. The second model, which is called the template, the second level, is actually use case specific. In this case, a GP visit will have a different set of data they need from the archetype, the blood pressure archetype, than a cardiologist. Makes sense, right? So the cardiologist wants more detail, whereas the GP just needs the blood pressure from that archetype. Now, the key thing here is that whichever use case uh, or template you store data through, it will always be stored in the same underlying archetypes, which means that you can query across and you will get all the blood pressures from your system, regardless of which form or use case was used to produce the data. Now, we don't have time to go into details, uh, but uh, you can learn much more about this on the OpenEHR website. So I talked about clinicians building these models. And today we are proud to have over 1,500 clinicians from 100 countries doing clinical modeling. It has to be said that the clinical models are free to use uh, for anybody. There is nobody that will keep them uh, for themselves. So we are sharing a lot of knowledge. They are translated into many languages. Just to give you an example, when COVID uh, first appeared, it hit China first. So China built the first models to manage COVID. When Italy was hit next, they already could use those models, translated them to Italian, but also added some of their own functionality. And when the UK was hit next, the, uh, some of our customers had built forms uh, for managing COVID before the first COVID patient came through the door. So this is the power of community. And as you can see here, uh, Norway is leading the way in terms of the number of modelers, uh, then Sweden, um, uh, Brazil, US, and so on. The size of the flag here uh, shows uh, the size of the modeling community. Okay, so let's talk about how we get there, right? Uh, obviously, none of us has a greenfield situation. We already have applications and systems that are running. We call this legacy. But what we don't realize is that next to the legacy, we have a lot of other applications. So what that means is that even if we try to solve the legacy problem, we still have a lot of other applications to deal with. And what we're proposing to customers and what we see happening is that instead of building the next new app on top of the legacy stack, you actually put in what we call an innovation platform based on open data like OpenEHR, and you develop the application differently, not replicating the same problems with data you had on the left, but you actually surrender the data from the application to the, uh, the platform. And that means that as you add other applications, they inherently share the same data. They do not store data in their own format, so you don't have the same problem as you have with the current systems. And in the end, you have a system where you can still have the legacy running, but the innovation, the clinical apps uh, from many companies can run on the new uh, data models, which are open, and understandable by everybody. And you can start to move some of the data from the legacy systems, mostly the clinical data, into this new platform. Uh, and then if you have to replace the legacy, it's a much easier job because you have a consistent care record outside of the legacy systems. This is sometimes called the postmodern EHR, uh, and it's a very valid approach where you already have systems running. So if you extrapolate this to the community, what you find is that you can do this uh, in many institutions, uh, keep the data on premise at each of these institutions, but normalize it to the same format. 
And of course, you can then query across uh, and actually create a consistent care record of what we call um, um, uh, one uh, patient, one record. Uh, we have choice at the application level, but we have strict governments at the data level so that we're able to query across and create a virtual care record. Uh, the side effect of this is also that if you build an app in one of these institutions, tie it to the data, you can actually share it with the others because it will run off the same data. So you can also centralize, of course, uh, these two are equivalent logically, uh, exactly the same thing, but this one is more efficient running off one instance of that data. So uh, let me quickly talk about uh, some of the products uh, that, uh, that we provide as a company. So obviously we uh, are a big proponent of open data, open APIs, uh, a modular uh, architecture, which is not monolithic, uh, low-code tools which enable you to quickly build applications, and of course, a heavy focus on design and sharing all the content with the community. So the platform, the digital health platform, as it's called, has three main components. The longitudinal care record, uh, the low-code tools, which we call Studio, and the portal, which puts everything together in a consistent way and provides a common user experience for the users of these applications. And the users could be from across the spectrum, from the citizen or the patient, all the way to uh, community, uh, primary care, and of course, the hospitals as well. As long as they're dealing with healthcare data, uh, they can use the platform to build applications. Now, we're very proud that Gartner recently put us on the map. Uh, they have just defined the digital health platform uh, space. Uh, and you can see that we are among some great company here. Um, I won't have time to go into details uh, about the platform. Let's just say that it's running in 120 installations. Some of them are very large. Uh, our largest installation has 12 million patient records live and 1,000 institutions which manage the data uh, on top of a single platform. Um, we have tools to design the data models, uh, tools to build forms and applications like form builders. But the difference here is that these forms are built on top of the data. The data is not uh, an afterthought after you have designed an, a form. Uh, uh, but it's actually the form is built from the data models, ensuring that it will actually be able to store data as, to, as soon as you have designed it. Um, and if these forms can also run, of course, on tablets and, and mobile devices. Uh, the portal itself uh, is uh, where these forms run. Uh, it manages users, uh, patient uh, word lists, uh, summary views, and so on. And of course, uh, we have an application to manage uh, medications inside a hospital. So inpatient uh, prescribing uh, is one of our core applications, which is now used extensively, mostly in the UK. Um, putting it all together is a design system, which uh, uh, actually standardizes the way we present information. Uh, and it's actually won the Red Dot Award uh, for the best design. So I'll just quickly go through some use cases. Um, obviously, OpenEHR now has a global presence. You saw 100 comp uh, countries which have modelers of OpenEHR data. Uh, the largest system running is the one I mentioned before, 12 million citizens across uh, a city like Moscow. All the health data stored in one platform with the concept I described before. Uh, the Slovenian interoperability backbone is another such example of a national system uh, running open EHR data at the center for the shared care record. Uh, Malta's national health records platform, uh, Wales in the UK has now decided to use open EHR. Um, Ost Gotland in Sweden uh, is uh, now piloting a digital platform to develop new apps. Uh, all the leading university hospitals in Germany are using OpenEHR for research. 
including Charité, including Heidelberg. Uh, they're using this approach, keeping data on premise and then actually connecting it through federated queries into one logical record. Uh, the children's clinic is important uh, here in Slovenia because it's a HIMS MRAM stage six hospital running completely on an open platform. Uh, all the four leading vendors in the Nordics use OpenEHR, which is quite interesting. Tieto Every has built uh, their life care product, new version on OpenEHR. DIPS has been using OpenEHR for over five years. Patient Sky, uh, the leading vendor of primary care in Norway, same thing. And Cambio, the leading vendor in Sweden as well. In the NHS, it's really spreading fast. Uh, there's over 30 trusts now which use OpenEHR. Uh, there's Genomics England, uh, uh, a number of university hospitals, uh, great adoption in the NHS. Uh, Birmingham Cancer Alliance, 17 hospitals there. So the last one which I want to talk about is the Catalan Health Service, which has standardized on OpenEHR for the entire healthcare system of Catalonia. This is a project that is just starting, but it's actually really huge. Uh, and OpenEHR is at the center of that. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll just close with a few slides about better. So our mission is to improve lives by helping care teams to simplify their work, accelerate digital, and base everything on the data for life concept. Um, we are now uh, in business for 30 years. We have 130 employees. We, uh, we are present in 16 markets with 120 customers and over 15 partners. Uh, you can see some of the partners here. I talked about them before. We just signed a contract uh, with Atos dealing with CGI for five years. Uh, again, proud of this slide, but let me just close about what is the data for life concept or the new normal, which we call it. Monolithic and uneconomical EHRs are actually impeding digital transformation and innovation. So data is for life, uh, while applications change. So there is a need to separate those two. The digital health platform offers uh, a portal, uh, a low-code tools, and a vendor-neutral data layer. OpenEHR is now widely used by the most advanced healthcare systems like Catalonia and the Nordics. And of course, we as a company offer a proven, scalable, and open digital health platform based on OpenEHR with over 120 installations in 15 countries. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and open the floor for questions. Thank you.